I think that's the one of the key points, and I was um, I was uh, really shocked the first time that you that I heard you mention that. So you described this gap between propulsion and drag, and in order to increase your swimming speed, you either have to increase propulsion or reduce drag. And so right. what you're saying is that because of this this three percent level of efficiency of an average swimmer, the the fastest way to improve speed is going to work on streamlining, right? Reduce drag. Reduce drag, right. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, so, the thing is, the thing is, and, and here's, I think, the key point, is most people, when they're in the pool, what are they doing? They're looking at the pace clock, and they're trying to make that number go down, and how do they do that? Well, instinctively, they just pull and kick harder. I mean, uh -huh. our instincts are what drive <laughs> us. So what I'm saying is you have to be rational and mindful uh, about how you go about this and think about the fact that a reduction in drag is going to lower that number on the pace clock, but there's going to be a lot less energy cost if you go that way. Uh huh. Now, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, surely this doesn't apply to already skilled swimmers. Why not? Or does it? <laughs> <laughs> Why well, not? I, so, I, all right. I, I, you know, so I think I'm probably about eight percent efficient. All right, a world class mm -hmm. swimmer is nine percent efficient, but I'm 63 years old, so you know, I'm I'm elite <laughs> in my age group. I can't swim at those speeds. Right, but I think I'm at about eight percent efficient, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning s subtle ways to reduce my drag, and I think it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think you ever run out of opportunities for learning how to be a more efficient swimmer. I think that's a lifelong thing, no matter how long you swim. And and along the way, while you're in the pool, focusing on ways to reduce drag, the training that you need comes along for the ride. And and I think that's, that's one of the most most exciting exactly. things is that I yeah, can. Yeah, the way the way I put it is training happens. Yeah, <laughs> you know I can go to the pool and just to give people an example, I could choose a focal point that reduces my drag. For example, um, one thing that I focus on sometimes is thinking about where my hand enters the water. If it enters too far in front of my head, then in order to get it to a full extension, I'm going to sort of be pushing water out of the way to get it there. Yeah. If I enter it in a better space to move directly to extension without a lot of movement under the water, I'm improving my streamlining. Now if right. I use that focal point while I'm swimming against the clock and trying to improve my speed without adding extra strokes, all while thinking about that focal point, that's a really strong example of how I'm not only focusing my attention during the swim, uh, but I'm also improving my, my uh, motor neural connection to that movement. And at the right. same time, my heart rate is getting up, and I'm getting those heartbeats and those muscular uh, aerobic enzymes taking place that's going to make me um, stronger in the places where I need to be stronger, not in places where I don't need it. Exactly. You know, as you go faster, without question, the metabolic cost go increases, so that training happens, all right? Mm -hmm. But it, it won't increase nearly as much as if you were doing it by bullying your way through the water and, and you're just practicing something that will never get you through a triathlon. So why practice something you don't want to use in the race? Mm -hmm. um, Mike, you had an interesting comment during our rehearsal about how much efficiency can vary between two athletes moving at the same speed in each of the three legs of, the, of triathlon. And really? I think you alluded to this earlier, but d tell us a little more about that. Well, well I, I, you know, Terry mentioned 3%, 8%, 9%, and so you can see people swimming the same speeds, their auction costs could vary by as much as, you know, two or three fold. Whereas if you Which look is at huge. Re huge, but if you look at reasonably skilled runners running 8, 9, 10, even 11 or 12 miles an hour, it's plus or minus perhaps 15%. Mm -hmm. And with cycling, it's probably even less, maybe plus or minus 10%. Those would be on ergometers in the lab, but but also probably if, if people can uh, get in a, a good road bike and, and get or a good tri bike and get in a narrow position. So I think to amplify what Terry said, the goal in swimming should be to go faster at the same oxygen cost. Mm -hmm. The goal in, in running and to some extent cycling it, is to be able to sustain a higher oxygen consumption longer. Uh huh. So it's almost flipped because you can you can gain tremendous improvements by increasing your efficiency or economy in swimming. Uh huh. You can probably do that as 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 Bobby alluded to with the uh, improved position and the 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 aero position on the bike, but there are some trade offs. But over the years, it's been very very difficult to actually improve people's efficiency running. There are some examples here, some examples there. 
but but there's nothing like the gains you can get in swimming uh, uh, in running. Mm-hmm.